Hello YouTube. Today we're going to talk about the problem of the many. So consider a single cloud in the sky. This cloud is a collection of water droplets. Uh, now think about the boundaries of the cloud. Obviously these boundaries are not sharp. If you zoom in you will find that the uh, density of water droplets gradually decreases until eventually the water droplets are so few that we would be more inclined to say that they are near the cloud rather than part of the cloud. So where exactly are the boundaries of the cloud? Which collection of water molecules exactly is the cloud? Well, we can't say. There are indefinitely many candidates that are equally good. So you know, we, we have, uh, let's call it C1, a particular collection of water droplets, C2, same as C1 but with one additional droplet, C3, and so on. There are trillions of uh, different ways of drawing the exact boundaries. All of these, and many more, appear to have equal claim to being the cloud. If we say that all of them are a cloud, then what we thought was one cloud is actually many trillions of different clouds. Uh, on the other hand, any reason for denying that any of these is a cloud would seem to generalize to all the others. So then there's nothing that is the cloud. There is no cloud. Um, this is the, uh, the problem of the many. Uh, there are many objects that are equally good candidates for being the cloud. So, you know, either we accept that there are actually many clouds or that there is no cloud. So uh, the argument can be presented like this. If there is a cloud, there is a complex of atoms, C1, that is identical with the cloud. There are trillions of complexes of atoms that differ minutely from C1. So if there is a cloud, there are trillions of complexes of atoms that differ minutely from the complex of atoms identical with the cloud. If a complex of atoms C2 differs even minutely from C1, then C2 is identical with a cloud distinct from the cloud with which C1 is identical. Uh, obviously, two things that differ can't be the same thing. Uh, so, conclusion, if there is a cloud, there are trillions of clouds. I mean, ultimately, we have a clash between two intuitions. On the one hand, we want to say there's just one object, just one cloud up there. On the other hand, there are many collections of molecules that all have equally appropriate grounds for being a cloud. And so this seems to give us trillions of clouds. Obviously, this problem arises for any object that has vague boundaries. So pretty much all the objects you encounter in your everyday life are subject to the problem of the many. You think that you have one computer in front of you, but uh, you know, we can play the same game. Or take Mount Everest. There are bits of Earth at the base of Mount Everest where it isn't clear whether or not these are part of Mount Everest. There are countless ways of drawing the boundary around Mount Everest, so it seems there are trillions of Mount Everests. So that's the problem of the many. Uh, we will examine some solutions in this video. Uh, there are a huge number of proposed solutions in the literature, so this is not going to be exhaustive. Uh, I'm just going to go through the ones that um, I find the most interesting. Okay, one solution, mirological nihilism. Uh, this is the solution accepted by Peter Unger. Unger was the philosopher who first introduced this problem, or at least he was the one who gave it the name, the problem of the many. Um, and he, he, uh, he takes the argument that we just saw to be sound. He accepts that if there is a cloud, then there must be trillions of clouds. But then he concludes, um, well, there actually just is no cloud at all, uh, nor are there any other composite objects. Uh, this is mirological nihilism. The nihilist says there are no composite objects, there are no objects that are composed of parts. The only objects that actually exist are mirological simples. So these are basically fundamental particles, whatever they may be. Um, at the moment we think the fundamental particles are fermions and bosons, um, but you know the, the important point is that Whatever the fundamental particles ultimately are, they never form any composite objects. Of course, there are particles arranged in various ways, and this perhaps gives the impression that there are composite objects, but this is a kind of illusion. Uh, there are no clouds, only particles arranged cloud-wise. There are no computers, only particles arranged computer-wise. No humans, only particles arranged human-wise. If we speak loosely, we can talk of clouds and objects and computers, but really there are no such, ob such objects. So in this view, the problem of the many doesn't arise. Um, yes, there are various collections of particles up there. Uh, 
strictly speaking, be, that there are no collections of water droplets because a water droplet is a composite would would be a composite object. Um, you, know, you break it down into different parts. But yeah, there are various collections of fundamental particles. But none of these is identical with a cloud because there are no clouds because there are no composite objects. I should note that there are uh, various other motivations for meteorological nihilism. It isn't just proposed in response to this problem. Uh, obviously, we won't go into those details here, but uh, I will note just a couple of the standard objections. Um, so one of the most obvious objections to meteorological nihilism is a lot of people think this is just absurd to say that there are no composite objects, no clouds, no computers, no humans is ridiculous. It's completely in conflict with common sense. Surely, uh, the fact that there are clouds and computers and so on is an obvious fact. It's more obvious than any uh, philosophical premises we might use in an argument against the existence of clouds and computers. So it is just silly to deny this. However, it's not really obvious that nihilism is in conflict with common sense. Um, after all, common sense tells us also that objects are made up of parts, ultimately uh, kind of bottoming out in the fundamental particles. The nihilist doesn't deny that there are particles arranged in various ways. Nihilism is entirely consistent with the appearances, or at least so the nihilist would say. Uh, here's a useful analogy that comes from C. Andor. Imagine that your computer were to cease to exist, but the molecules composing your computer were to remain, and they were to stay exactly as they are. Well, you wouldn't notice. Uh, indeed, you couldn't distinguish this in any way from the situation in which your computer continues to exist. So the nihilist will say, look, I'm offering a technical theory of objects and parthood relations, and this theory is fully consistent with our everyday experiences of the world. Uh, we can account for the appearance of composite objects as, as, as being a kind of illusion. Um, so it's not really in conflict with common sense. That will be the claim. Well, here's a more uh, powerful objection. Nihilism requires that there must be meteorological symbols, genuinely fundamental particles that have no parts, and so cannot be divided further. But is this true? It seems at least possible that division could go on forever without limit. Uh, maybe quarks are composed of further objects, and those objects are themselves composed of further objects, and so on, without end. Uh, even if this is ruled out by our contemporary physical theories, well, physical theories have been wrong before. We can't conclusively be sure that this is not true. Now, this is a problem, it seems, for nihilism, because if there are no meteorological symbols, then, according to nihilism, there are no material objects at all. And that does look like a, a more strained conclusion. Um, at least it seems like that can't be the right analysis of objects and parthood relations. Uh, and certainly, you know, the nihilist can no longer save the appearances, as it were, by appealing to uh, particles arranged in particular ways, because uh, on, on this, it, you know, if this turns out to be true, well, there just are no particles, there are no objects whatsoever. Um, so those were, as I say, that those were just a couple of basic objections to meteorological nihilism. Um, there are many other reasons why nihilism was uh, proposed and uh, many other arguments against it. Um, but uh, this has not been the most popular uh, uh, response to the problem of the many. So let's turn to some other possible views. The second solution is the view that constitution is not identity. Uh, this rejects the first premise of the argument that we saw, the claim that if there is a cloud, there is a complex of atoms that is identical with the cloud. On this view, none of the complexes is identical with the cloud. Uh, th there are indeed many objects here, there are many complexes of atoms, but none of them is a cloud. The cloud is something else. The cloud is constituted by these various complexes of atoms. Uh, material constitution is not identity. There are many uh, cloud constitutors, many arrangements of matter that constitute the cloud, but there is only one cloud. Uh, this position has been defended by Mark Johnston in, in the uh, aptly titled paper, Constitution is Not Identity. Uh, so this solution is not ad hoc. It has been applied to various other puzzles of material constitution. Uh, there's the classic case of 
the statue and the lump of clay. So imagine a statue that's made out of clay. We might be inclined to say that the statue just is the lump. The statue is identical to the lump of clay. After all, the statue and the lump of clay have exactly the same intrinsic properties. The, it's, it's the same arrangement of matter. You know, and if, you, if you hold the statue in your hand, you seem to be holding just one object. But in fact, the statue and the lump differ in important ways. For one thing, the lump existed before the statue, right? Initially, there was just a formless lump of clay which had to be shaped into the statue. Uh, furthermore, the statue and the lump have different persistence conditions. If I squash the statue down, that will destroy the statue, but it won't destroy the lump. So it seems that the statue and the lump actually have different properties. And of course, if X and Y have different properties, then X and Y are not identical. Uh, so arguably, what we should say in this case is that the lump constitutes the statue, but the lump is not identical to the statue. Similarly, there are important differences between clouds and cloud constituting uh, complexes of atoms. A cloud can change, it can gain or lose parts. That's a perfectly ordinary way of talking about clouds. But none of the cloud constitutors can gain or lose parts. If you take a molecule from uh, C2, you end up with C1, or one of the many other different cloud constitutors. Um, you know, these, these are all different objects. The cloud survives these changes in its constitution, whereas the cloud constitutors don't. Now, of course, we might try to get around this um, by, instead of, by, by looking at a complex of atoms over time, by you know, defining the complex of atoms, not just at a given time, but at several times. Uh, so we, we might take C1 star to be a changing complex of atoms associated with a cloud, where this is defined as C1a at T1, C1b at T2, C1c at T3, and so on. In that case, the complex of atoms can and will gain and lose parts, so it will change over time. But notice we would still want to say things like, uh, I don't know, the cloud could have been half the size it was, right? At any given time, the cloud could have had different properties than it actually had at this time. But then, of course, uh, C1 star couldn't, right? Uh, uh, again, if you take, um, say, C1a and you change some of, and you remove some atoms from it, well then, you don't have C1a anymore and you don't have C1 star. Uh, changing the complex of atoms would, of course, give us a different complex of atoms. So if we take some object, um, O, and then take the O-shaped constituting matter, Johnston says um, what most philosophers have assumed is that in order for there to be a difference between O and the O constituting matter, the difference must be metaphysical or it must be in the intrinsic properties of the objects. Um, the assumption that philosophers have made is, as Johnston puts it, that, and I quote, the justifying difference has to be substantial and characterizable independently of our practice of making judgments which exhibit certain patterns and demarcations. And Johnston says we should just reject this. Um, his position seems to be that clouds and other objects um, are not completely independent of us, but conceptual tools that we use to track patterns in the world. Um, we have a practice of talking about objects, counting objects, reasoning with objects. Uh, and when we count clouds, we're not actually even trying to count the cloud-shaped clusters of water droplets that are in the same approximate place as the cloud. There doesn't need to be a metaphysical distinction between O and the uh, constituting O-shaped matter. Um, so yeah, constitution is not identity. The cloud is something different from the complexes of atoms that compose it. Um, so David Lewis, in his article, Many But Almost One, raises a couple of objections to this view. First of all, Lewis says that the intuition driving the claim that constitution is not identity is less persuasive if we consider temporal parts. The statue and the lump are different objects because they have different temporal parts. I mean, they, they exist at different times. So the lump exists at, say, 8 a.m., while the statue comes into existence at um, you know, 1 p.m. Uh, later that day. If you, if you consider it over the whole time of their existence then, the statue is actually part of the lump. Um, you know, in the same way, my room is part of my house. They overlap but have different spatial parts. But then consider 
one particular moment in time. Well, then we can say this temporal part of the statue is identical to the temporal part of the lump. There's literally nothing to distinguish them. In the same way, the spatial part that is my room uh, is identical to the spatial part of my room in my house. Um, now, of course, this doesn't show that constitution is identity, but perhaps it undermines some of the appeal of denying that constitution is identity. Lewis's second objection is that even if we accept that constitution is not identity, this doesn't really provide us with a solution. Instead, we've simply replaced the original problem with a similar one. Uh, originally, we had the problem of many clouds, but now we have the problem of one cloud plus many cloud constitutors. Our initial intuition was that there's only one cloud. Now, apparently, we need to postulate one cloud plus an indefinite variety of cloud constitutors. But how is that an improvement? Um, you know, how does that solve the problem of there being many objects? I mean, this, this uh, problem becomes particularly acute when we consider that cloud constitutors are exactly like clouds. Uh, uh, they have the same intrinsic properties as clouds, the same mass, same shape, same density, which of course raises the question, well, what makes them not clouds? Um, Lewis uh, phrases, frames this problem in terms of not clouds, but animals. He talks about Tibbles the cat. So if we take the line that constitution is not identity, then we have the cat, Tibbles, plus an indefinite variety of cat constitutors, which differ from each other in various atoms at the boundary of Tibbles. The cat constitutors are all cat-like in their shape, size, weight, motion, vocalization, inner organs. Uh, they're, they're, they're all cat-like in every way. Uh, they're indistinguishable from cats. Whatever Tibbles does, the cat constitutors will do as well. So who's to say, then, that the cat constitutors are not just cats? Uh, what grounds are there for denying that they are just cats? So an interesting spin on the constitution is not identity view, um, which uh, perhaps solves Lewis's problems, has been proposed by Michael Pelkzar in his article, uh, An Unexciting Solution to the Problem of the Many. Pelkzar holds that a cloud is not identical to a complex of atoms. Rather, a cloud is, uh, as he puts it, that which exists if and only if there is at least one out of a certain set of possible complexes of atoms. Basically, Pelksar's idea is that the existence of a cloud involves the satisfaction of a disjunction. So C1 exists, or C2 exists, or C3 exists, and so on for the many trillions of atom complexes. So consider um, Tibbles again. Suppose you believe that Tibbles has entirely black fur, and then you discover on closer inspection that in fact there are a couple of white hairs on Tibbles. Uh, you've you've learned that some of the atoms that you thought constituted Tibbles actually do not. Would you conclude then that Tibbles doesn't exist? Uh, that the cat you thought was Tibbles is actually a completely different cat, con con constituted out of a completely different con complex of atoms? Well, surely not. You would instead conclude that Tibbles had slightly different properties than what you thought. What this everyday example shows, according to Pelksar, is that there's a large set of atom complexes where the existence of a given complex would be taken to be sufficient for Tibbles' existence. Um, so, you know, with one of these sets, the fur is entirely black. With another, there are some streaks of white. Tibbles exists just in case one of these complexes of atoms exist. And so it is with other objects. The claim then is that a single cloud exists if either C1 exists, or C2 exists, or C3 exists, and so on. There is not one cloud that exists if C1 exists, another cloud that exists if C2 exists. There is one cloud, the existence of which is overdetermined. And this overdetermination shouldn't be surprising. Uh, it's connected to our talk of the modal properties of the cloud. We would be happy to say that the cloud could have been different in various ways. The cloud could have had one fewer atom, would have been the same cloud, had one fewer atom. This is just to say there are a variety of atom complexes that are sufficient for the existence of the cloud. Um, and an indefinite variety of these complexes actually obtain. So one worry about this is that it, um, it might undermine part of what's appealing about denying that constitution is identity. So uh, consider this case. Suppose I have a statue of 
Frank Zappa. Now I could carve this down into a statue of Captain Beefheart, or a statue of any other person for that matter. Obviously, the many complexes of atoms that we would take as constituting the Beefheart statue already exist. So on Pelksar's view, there's already a statue of Beefheart, and countless other statues. Uh, there's an indefinite variety of other statues already existing there. But saying there is a statue of Captain Beefheart seems false. Um, one appeal of the view that constitution is not identity is, is precisely that it allows us to uh, accommodate uh, uh, th this kind of intuition. And uh, obviously on Pelksar's view, that, uh, is, that appeal is lost. Um, OK, let's, um, let's have a look at another solution. This is supervaluationism. On this solution, only one of the many is a cloud but it's indeterminate which one. The claim is that, strictly speaking, right, only one of C1, C2, C3, and so on is actually the cloud. All the rest are not clouds. So there's only one cloud here. Which one is the cloud? Well, this is up to us. It's a matter of how we choose to use the term cloud. We can use this term to pick out whatever complex of atoms we want. But obviously, we've never decided. Indeed, presumably, we couldn't decide, even if we wanted to. We just don't know enough about the fine details of the cloud on a molecular level. But now notice, the fact that we haven't decided doesn't actually matter. Uh, suppose I say the plane is flying through the cloud. Whether or not this is true depends on the uh, reference of the terms. Uh, it depends on what is picked out by the term plane, what is picked out by the term cloud, it depends on what the word flying means, and so on. Now. Our term cloud can pick out any of the trillions of C1, C2, C3. But here's the thing. The sentence, the plane is flying through the cloud, can be true under whatever interpretation we choose. Right, so the idea is there are, there are a range of reasonable interpretations for the term cloud, a range of C1, C2, C3, and so on, that could count as the cloud. And the sentence is true under any of these interpretations. So this is where we can appeal to this idea of supervaluationism. Uh, this is an approach that was originally developed uh, for other problems related to vagueness. Uh, consider a term like heap. One million grains of sand is a heap. One grain of sand is not a heap. But where exactly is the line between heaps and non-heaps? How many grains of sand exactly make for a heap of sand? Well, that's vague. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a sharp boundary, a point where adding a single grain of sand transforms a non-heap into a heap. So the term heap is vague, right? There are some piles of sand that are borderline cases, neither clearly heaps nor clearly non-heaps. We're unsure about whether the predicate applies to them. Here's what the supervaluationist says. The term heap can be precisified. We can decide to use the term heap in such a way that, I don't know, exactly 100 grains of sand is determinately a heap, while anything under it is determinately not a heap. Obviously, there are many ways to precisify the term. We could instead say that exactly 90 grains of sand is a heap, or exactly 105 grains of sand is a heap. Now, we say that a precisification is admissible, just in case every sentence that is determinately true or determinately false in standard English comes out as true or false in the precisified English. One million grains of sand is determinately a heap. Two grains of sand is determinately not a heap. For 90 grains, well, maybe that's unclear. 90 grains is a borderline case. So the idea is every admissible precisification must have it that one million grains is a heap and two grains is not a heap. Then some precisifications will have it that 90 grains is a heap. Others will have it that 90 grains is not a heap. The precisification draws a sharp boundary and it can draw the sharp boundary somewhere in the borderline cases. That's basically the idea. So our, our English term heap fails to draw a sharp line. We can precisify it in many ways such that a sharp line is drawn. Let me say that a statement is super true just in case it's true under all admissible precisifications. So if A is a heap under all admissible precisifications, then it's super true that A is a heap. And the statement is super false, just in case it's false under all admissible precisifications. Um, and then otherwise, if it's true in some precisifications and false in others, then it's super indeterminate. Now notice, 
If a statement is super true, then the original English statement, despite its precision, must also be true. So if a, if a statement is true on every admissible way of precisifying the terms, then, well, it's just true, right? Uh, it, like if, if it's true under every way of removing the vagueness, then the vagueness doesn't matter anymore. We can just ignore the vagueness um, and just say the statement is true. So we can apply this kind of framework to the problem of the many. The facts that determine meanings, facts about our use of words like cloud, facts about how speakers are causally connected to things in the world, these do not determine a unique interpretation of cloud. They do not fix our term cloud to any of C1, C2, C3 in particular, but we can precisify. Uh, C1, C2, C3 are all admissible precisifications. We can select one as the referent of cloud. Whichever one we choose, the statement, the plane is flying through the cloud, will be true. It's true under all admissible precisifications. So corresponding to each of the many is an interpretation of our language, uh, an interpretation of the referent of the term cloud. Each interpretation selects just one of C1, C2, C3 as the referent, and it excludes all the others. And what this means is that under any one interpretation, it comes out as determinately true um, that, you know, so it may be determinately true that C1 is a cloud and determinately false that all the others are clouds. Under all admissible precisifications, it's true then that there is only one cloud because each precisification will select just one of the complexes of atoms. So there is only one cloud is super true, true under all interpretations. And since it's super true, well, you know, it's, we can just take it as true, right? The original English sentence, there is only one cloud, despite its indeterminacy, is just true. So, uh, yeah, so basically the term cloud is vague because it admits of different precisifications, but on each of these precisifications, one and only one of the many is a cloud. And so there is only one cloud is true. Uh, so hopefully you can see the benefit of supervaluationism, right? On this approach, we, we have it that it's true that there's only one cloud, and that's because the proposition there is only one cloud is true under all admissible precisifications. But supervaluationism also acknowledges that there are no grounds on which to decide which of the complexes of atoms is identical with the cloud. There are countless op options, and you know we we've never uh, we've never decided. Indeed, we could never decide which one to pick. So um, yeah, this, uh, this position uh, also gains, I suppose, some plausibility from the fact that, as I mentioned, it was developed in response to uh, different problems related to vagueness. Um, specifically, it was developed in response to deal with the Sorites paradox. Um, and so, you know, it already has a kind of independent motivation. There are uh, some problems uh, with supervaluationism in this context, though. So the first problem, uh, noted by Dan Lopez de Sa in his article Lewis versus Lewis on the problem of the many. Um, so w one concern that he raises about uh, supervaluationism here uh, appeals to what he calls the principle of minute differences. And this is the principle that if X is a paradigm case of an F, and if Y is very similar to X with respect to features relevant for something being an F, then y is also an f. The idea of a paradigm f is that it's, um, so something is a paradigm f when it's a central example of an f. Like an apple is a paradigm fruit. There are some fruits that people might debate about. Is a tomato a fruit? What about a bell pepper, a cucumber? Well, in these cases, you can expect debates, but clearly an apple is a fruit. And that's the case whether we're using the fruit, the, the t whether we're using the term fruit in the you know, technical sense in botany or in just the kind of everyday colloquial sense, uh, like when we talk about making a fruit salad. Clearly, no matter how we're using the term, an apple is a paradigm fruit. Um, so anyway, the, the claim of this principle is that something that differs minutely from an apple must also be a fruit. Um, even if whatever this, even if this thing that differs is not a paradigm fruit, given that an apple is a paradigm fruit, if something differs from it ever so slightly, that must at least be a fruit as well. Uh, you can't go from a paradigm F to something that's not an F with just minute differences. 
And I mean, we can we might we can just specify that minute differences are imperceptible differences, right? Imagine changing a few molecules or something. Now the trouble is, it seems that the supervaluationist violates this principle. Um, so look at the sky and pick out an obvious cloud, a paradigm cloud, something that is without any serious question a cloud. The supervaluationist treats the term cloud as vague. On one precisification, C1 is a cloud. Ah, so C1 is the paradigm cloud. But then C2, which differs from C1 by a mere single molecule, but otherwise completely overlaps with it, that's not a cloud. And this seems especially absurd when we consider that there are other clouds in the sky which, uh, which have a completely different number and arrangement of molecules to C1. So, you know, Cx, right, the complex of atoms associated with another cloud, right? C, Cx uh, differs significantly from C1 and is a cloud, while C2 differs only by a single molecule and is not a cloud. Uh, so this point is related to a further problem. We might wonder whether supervaluationism can be you know, extended to terms like cloud. In, in the case of terms such as heap, uh, supervaluationism seems reasonable because we can specify exactly the boundaries between heaps and non-heaps. Um, you know, we can precisify, and the precisification will specify ex an exact boundary between heaps and non-heaps, and then we can apply this boundary across the board to all potential heaps. Um, the precisification of heap will tell us the specific number of grains that count as a heap, and then it will just apply this everywhere. In the case of cloud, by contrast, we're not choosing a specific number of molecules that count as a cloud. The precisification just randomly picks out one of the many complexes of atoms associated with the cloud. So how then does this apply to other clouds? Now, of course, for the term heap, the precisification will draw an arbitrary line, but that line is applied straightforwardly to all other piles of things. On any given precisification, there is going to be a principled difference between heaps and non-heaps. And that doesn't seem to be the case with the precisification of cloud. C1 is much more similar to C2 than to all the other clouds. That there is no principled difference here between clouds, you know, C1, Cx, and non-clouds, like C2. So this may be... Um, a reason to worry about uh, supervaluationism. Um, a final problem for the supervaluationist, again from uh, Dan Lopez de Sa. One unwelcome consequence of supervaluationism is that it seems to turn out that on this approach there are no determinate cases of clouds. In the case of predicates such as heap, there will be many things that are determinately heaps because many things count as heaps on all admissible precisifications. One million grains is a heap, no matter what precisification we use. So one million grains is determinately a heap. It's, it's not a borderline case. It's not within the vague boundaries. The same goes for non-heaps. Now, intuitively, uh, it seems like the world contains plenty of things that are determinately clouds. Uh, again, I can look at the sky and pick out something that is just clearly a cloud. The trouble is that on supervaluationism, each uh, cloud candidate uh, is excluded by all but one of the precisifications. Each candidate only counts as a cloud on one particular precisification. So then nothing is determinately a cloud. There is nothing that, that, that determinately satisfies the term cloud. There is nothing that is a cloud under all precisifications. Everything then is a, a mere borderline case. Uh, ev every cloud is a borderline cloud. Um, and this is going to be the case for any object that is subject to the problem of the many. Um, again, this seems like a strange result. At least it's certainly not as um, kind of straightforward and intuitive as it is with a term like heap. Um, OK, then. So those are some problems for supervaluationism. Let's turn to the last solution we will consider. This is the partial identity solution. And this is uh, favoured by David Lewis in the aforementioned article, Many But Almost One. Uh, so far we've seen various attempts to, uh, well we've seen a couple of attempts to affirm the intuition that there is just one cloud. The partial identity approach, by contrast, simply accepts the original argument that, that we saw. Uh, each cloud constitutor is a cloud, and each of these clouds is different. 
So there really are countless trillions of clouds where there seems to be only one. Um, obviously this seems rather counterintuitive, so the task is to explain why we are inclined to say that there is just one cloud. This is where the idea of partial identity comes in. Lewis says we can consider a spectrum of degrees of identity. At one end, there is complete identity. A thing is identical with itself. Uh, a thing and itself share all the same properties and have all parts in common. They don't differ in any way at all. At the other end, there is uh, complete distinctness. Uh, two objects that don't share any parts in common, such as my cup and my computer. There is no overlap between them. They're made of completely different sets of particles. Then there are various cases in between, things which exhibit partial overlap of parts. Close to the distinct end, there's the case of conjoined twins who are conjoined at a finger. They're almost completely distinct, they share only a finger in common. But then close to the identity end, well, we can consider our many clouds. C1 and C2 overlap almost entirely. They share all their parts in common except one single water molecule. So they're almost identical, not totally identical, but almost identical. Now Lewis says, strictly speaking, there are trillions of clouds where there seems to be one. But any two of these clouds are almost identical. They share almost all of their parts in common. And in everyday contexts, we rarely have cause to speak strictly about things. Uh, since all of the uh, trillions of clouds are almost identical, the statement you know, a statement like, there is one cloud above me, is almost true. It's approximately true, which is true enough for everyday purposes. If we're doing philosophy, then of course we will want to draw finer distinctions. But in almost every other context, whether we're, you know, talking about the sky or predicting the weather or conducting an experiment involving clouds, it's true enough to say that there is one cloud. We don't lose anything by making this simplification. So as Lewis puts it, um, there are many clouds, but almost one. We often make claims that are not true, but only approximately true. Uh, I say that my height is five foot six inches, but I'm not five foot six precisely. I haven't men measured my height with any uh, greater accuracy, and in any case, height changes throughout the day, depending on whether you're standing up or laying down. So my height is approximately five foot six. Strictly speaking, it's false that I'm five foot six, but it's close enough to the truth that we take it as true for almost all purposes. Or consider the table is flat. I would say that the table I'm currently working on is flat because all of the objects placed upon it are stable. None of them slide, none of them wobble. But of course, if you zoom in on the table, you'll find plenty of bumps and ridges. And if I were conducting a precision physics experiment, uh, I, I certainly wouldn't say that the table is flat, that this table is flat. It wouldn't be flat enough for that. Um, so the table is approximately flat. Flat enough for my purposes, but not flat enough for a precision experiment. And of course, we never in the real world will ever have a table that is genuinely perfectly flat. We always only get approximations. On Lewis's analysis then, um, the problem of the many is an instance of this standard point about approximate truth. We use approximately true statements um, in, in contexts where approximate truths function the same way that exact truths would function. Right? Approximate truths can play the same role as exact truths, but they're a lot more simple. Um, they streamline our thinking and, I mean, well, the, the truth itself is often beyond our grasp. So that's uh, Lewis's solution. Um, one objection to this is that, like nihilism, it strikes many people as, a, as an extremely counterintuitive position. I mean, ultimately, Lewis does hold that what seems to be a single cloud is, in fact, many trillions of clouds. And this has some striking consequences in other contexts. The problem of the many applies to persons as much as clouds. So it turns out you are not a single person. Rather, there are trillions of conscious entities, all of them occupying nearly the same place as you, all of them almost identical with you. Um, well, maybe that does seem strange. Uh, nevertheless, I think, you know, I think this kind of like objection from common sense is pretty weak. I mean, like the nihilist, Lewis can say, well, look, I can account for why it appears that there is one and only one cloud, uh, one and only one person, with this point about partial identity. Um, you know, 
again, right, uh, being almost identical is good enough. Still, uh, the partial identity solution does face some problem cases. Here's one given by C.S. Sutton in the article Almost One. Imagine a pair of houses designed by a mad architect. The architect has designed the houses so that the shared wall is gigantically thick and makes up 95% of the total material of the two houses. The remaining 5% is divided between the two houses for living space. So it looks kind of like this. Um, essentially, you've just got this massive block of bricks with two very narrow, very cramped houses either side. Now, here's the problem. Um, if you take house A and house B, they share almost all of their parts in common um, because, because the shared wall is had in common. There is significant overlap. So on Lewis's theory, we should count these two houses as one house because they are almost identical. But um, at least Sutton says uh, we don't do that. I mean, I have to say my, my own intuitions about this case aren't really so clear. Um, so if we're supposing that these are two houses with a shared wall, I'm not sure. I think that where I, I get caught up on this is I'm not sure we should just grant that all of the wall is, is shared. I mean, if you take part of the wall that's just a couple of inches away from house A, is that is that part of the wall also part of house B? I mean, my, my initial intuition is it's just part of house A. Um, I, I guess that, you know, sort of we, we shade from house B to house A somewhere in, in the middle of this big wall. I suppose we can imagine, you know, the deeds specifying that the wall is entirely shared. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that would just be a matter of like legal ownership that need not track uh, object and parthood relations metaphysically. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I just find this, uh, um, I don't really know what to say about this case, I guess. So um, it, it doesn't really seem to me to present much of a challenge. But uh, this is uh, an objection that has been raised. Another potential problem case is noted by Lewis himself. So Lewis says, well, imagine that uh, Fred owns a house with a garage attached. Now, if I say, uh, let's go to Fred's house. Well, what does the phrase Fred's house refer to? We could take it to refer to the house plus the garage or to the house minus the garage. Both are equally good candidates for being Fred's house. Now, obviously, the two potential house constitutors here overlap substantially, but there are still significant differences between them. They differ significantly in size and mass. So in this case, we want to say, you know, there, there's one house but there's more than one good candidate for being the complex of molecules that are identical with the house. But some of those candidates are not even almost identical. Um, so yeah, there, there are trillions of complexes of atoms that are equally good candidates for being Fred's house, but some of them are not even almost identical because you know Fred's house plus garage and Fred's house minus garage are not almost identical. I mean, yes, there is significant overlap, but they're not almost identical. So it's not clear that Lewis's solution works in this particular case. Um, so uh, yeah, well, there, there you go. Um, that, that was the problem of the many and a few of the proposed solutions to it. Uh, and that's all. Thanks for watching.